PSA testing has driven the care of prostate cancer in the United States since the 1980s when it first began. And uh, what we've always said, all the organizations have recommended that we tell our patients about the advantages and disadvantages, risks and benefits. And there are two large phase three trials that have demonstrated uh, the outcomes when you compare PSA testing without. The US trial, the PLCO, did not find a reduction in prostate cancer mortality but the European trial did. And the European trial, basically the results of that have informed us that uh, we should offer PSA testing. But every organization in the United States recommends that we tell patients about the advantages and disadvantages, the risks and benefits. Interestingly, none of the organizations, American Cancer Society, American Neurologic Association, um, any of the organizations, <clears throat> um, American Neurologic Association, None of those give physicians um, uh, actual objective data, like if you're going to buy a car. What's the likelihood my car is going to break down in the next three years? You can go to Consumer Reports, and you get this massive amount of data um, and to inform you about you know, pros and cons of buying uh, this car or that car. Uh, so the American consumer doesn't really have this information, nor does the majority of PSA tests that are being ordered by primary care physicians. So the primary care physician doesn't understand some of the nuances that urologists understand or urologic oncologists understand. And so what we'll be presenting tomorrow, it's data that we published in JAMA Oncology a month and a half, two months ago, something like that. And it looks at um, the participants in the SELECT trial, which is the selenium and vitamin E cancer prevention trial, and in the prostate cancer prevention trial. It's about uh, uh, 54,000 people total men that were randomized in these trials. And what we did was we looked at the individuals who were diagnosed with prostate cancer, and then we had a comparable group of aging men that were aging along with them. And of the men who had prostate cancer, there were men who opted for surgery, men that opted for radiation. And then we had this aging group of men that live with them because we, the question is, what's the likelihood of complications? And the most common kinds of complications, the most common complication after treatment for prostate cancer is problem with erections, which is a problem that occurs with aging. So as men age, the erections don't get better, they tend to get worse. And so nobody's ever really tracked a group of comparable men to say what happens as you age versus if you have prostate cancer and are treated with surgery or radiation. And so what this paper provides <clears throat> is it provides a, um, a, an insight into the potential risks. Um, and it's really um, um, substantial. It's about a six-fold increased risk of uh, problems with erections and urination <clears throat> and um, in some estimates, around 60% of men who were treated for prostate cancer ultimately have some complications from it. Um, and this information then you can pass along to the patients who are thinking about uh, PSA testing. But the other thing that was really um, an, uh, an eye-opening experience to me was to see the risk of bladder cancer, which is about threefold higher in men who have had radiation. And if you think about it, when you give radiation for prostate cancer, you're getting pretty high doses. And a, um, a, a portion of the base of the bladder uh, receives radiation. We looked at men who, uh, the increased risk of bladder cancer, we also found a comparable increased risk of bladder cancer that required cystectomy. And so it's, it makes sense in the sense that if you have a bladder cancer that may be induced by radiation, it's probably a high grade cancer. And that high-grade cancer is more likely to be muscle invasive or high-grade and ultimately have a cystectomy. So it gives us some information to pass along to the patients to help them make that decision. Going back to the original premise, um, should we be informing men before they have their PSA test about the pros and cons, risks and benefits? This gives you some information to pass along to them. Although it's a bit complicated because how do you do that? You're a primary care physician. You have, what, 20 minutes? I don't know. I, my primary care doctor takes really good care of me, so I may have a half an hour with her. 
<laughs> but a lot of folks may have 15 minutes with a primary care doc to talk about cholesterol and blood pressure and you know how they're sleeping and how much alcohol they drink. And then you think about all that laundry list of things they need to talk about that's really important. How do you then have a 20 minute to 30 minute con conversation about pros and cons of PSA testing? And what we've done as a society is we've just not done it. We've just checked the box for the PSA test and the patient doesn't really yes. get that information until the test results come back. Oh, come back. And then they go to see their doctor who says, or the doctor says, I'm sending you to a urologist or another physician to evaluate the PSA test. They didn't even know what the PSA test was. Oh, yeah. And only later do they find out that prostate cancer is ubiquitous. It's very common as we age, and most prostate cancers won't cause problems, and they don't get that information until afterwards. But at that point in time, the only thing they're thinking about is, do I have cancer? So it's complicated, but we now have one more piece of the puzzle to be able to provide to them. All of the faculty here are really stellar faculty, and Dr. Parekh and his team at, uh, at Miami are, are, are superb. It's a, I was on the um, external advisory board for the Cancer Center here, and Steve Nimer runs uh, just a spectacular cancer center. It's, uh, uh, it was a, an honor to be able to watch as that cancer center was built, and, um, and so Dr. Parekh's work is part of that. But we, there are people like Peter Pinto from the NCI who are here, and others who are speaking on this. In fact, there's a session, first session <clears throat> this afternoon is on, um, I believe it's on testosterone. And uh, there's some really fascinating, we, we, we had a, a paper in New England Journal last year um, on, uh, on, uh, on a randomized trial of testosterone for about 5,000 or more men that were randomized to testosterone and placebo and stunningly found that uh, there's no change in prostate events, be it cancer or BPH and so forth. So there's a lot of kind of cutting edge information that people will find here. And so practitioners will, it's the, 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 the challenge in medicine uh, is that, you know, the publication rate is probably a hundred papers a minute or something like that. And how do you keep up with that? And then to have folks who come in who, you know, have a deep dive, you know, they may have a narrow and deep um, uh, area of knowledge and their practice may be segmented to that area. So they very thoughtful about it and then to get ideas to take back to your practice. So about half the time uh, when you say, what do you expect to get? I don't know. Um, and then the other thing about it is I'm at the, towards the end of my career, or maybe some might say at the end of my career, and then to watch these youngsters, these bright young folks, it gives you a real, um, appreciation for uh, how medicine's going to be just fine because it's got bright, committed, energetic, imaginative folks that are, you know, their their entire goal is to make life better for uh, for um, urology and for society and, and as a whole in, in this country. Mm -hmm.